Welcome to Peak Dawn with Chris Hall and today my guest Sean Wells. Now Sean Wells is one of the world's leading nutritional biochemists and um, he's an expert in health optimization and indeed he has personally been involved in the formulation with over 500, yes 500 supplements, food beverages, cosmeceuticals and he's indeed in invented 10 of his own uh, novel ingredients. So I believe that means it's literally ingredients he has created into existence uh, which is mind-blowing in itself. Um, now Sean is a fascinating gentleman because um, I came across him through um, some people that we've had on the show. Um, and indeed, I watched his KetoCon 2019 uh, presentation. And in that presentation, he talked about some of the health um, journeys that he's been on, whether that be chronic fatigue, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibro fibromyalgia, depression, insomnia, obesity, and indeed a pituitary tumor. Um, this journey for Sean has led him down a path of becoming what... Um, is now known as an ingredientologist. Um, and he's fascinated with things like microchondrial health. And um, he's on panels with all the top dogs doing all the top conferences. And Sean, it really is a bloody pleasure to have you on today. So welcome to the podcast. I can't wait to get into this oh. with you. Thank you for having me on, Chris. I'm excited. And and uh, yeah, I guess you could link that KetoCon presentation if someone wants to watch that. But yeah, I, I appreciate you watching it. Um, I That was my first time where I really opened up about my depression and suicidal thoughts and kind of telling my backstory of dealing with obesity. And, mm -hmm. you know, up until that point, I was always trying to play into the image of being the dietitian, being the formulator, being the sports nutritionist. And, and I was always just health, healthy and living at the top of my game. But that wasn't necessarily the truth. And it felt so freeing to go into all those things and, and discuss that. And that was really a turning point for me. So I'm glad you liked it. No, massively. And isn't it interesting how we can, yeah, when we then step into the sharing of where we've come from, um, that's all of a sudden, um, it's not just the skill set that you're bringing into the world, it's that combined with a connection point with audience and community, because it's all that, it's the vulnerability of, and the authenticity of, you know, should we say the problem and, and the solutions that it then led you to, um, which I believe for yourself in particular, um, keto uh, was one of the particular things that, you know, that I know you're a raving fan of, and, and that was one of the key things um, in that. Would you like to just kind of talk to you about that kind of keto connection to some of those fundamental things that you've been through? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I've been doing keto for about 20 years, so I've, I've been a little bit ahead of the curve there, but um, it was really a way, like when I had Epstein-Barr virus, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, Hashimoto's, I couldn't get out of bed for about six months. I thought my life was over. I was contemplating suicide. I had pain and inflammation, and it was just literally, I would spend all day, every day in bed. Uh, my master's degree got put on hold. And I wasn't sure I'd ever be a functional human being in society again. And it was the ketogenic diet that was able to pull me out of that. And then, and then I started shifting my supplementation from sports nutrition focus to energy and immune health and, and started doing paleo and all those kinds of things along the way. But that was a, that was a key linchpin for me was the ketogenic diet and what it does in terms of mitochondrial uh, health and, and biogenesis and uh, the, the anti-inflammatory pathways, um, uh, massive for me uh, in terms of turning my, my health around and being able to get back to being a human being and, and finishing up my master's degree, becoming a dietitian and a biochemist. So that, that was huge for me. Absolutely. And it's a journey that has been incredibly pivotal for yourself, but it's also been something that's been shared um, over time with more and more people um, via yourself and the keto community. Um, again, in that 2019 talk, I remember you talking about there was a lady um, that had a, a significant brain tumor as well. Um, and yeah. after, I think it was a matter of, I can't recall exactly, but it was a short period, weeks or months after trying, you know, shifts in supplementation, keto, et cetera, astounding results. I think it went from like half the brain to a third or a quarter or something like that. Yeah, it was a, it was a 40 percent of her brain was a was a tumor with glioblastoma multiform, and uh, she was given six weeks to live. Mm -hmm. uh, she was taken off of chemo and radiation, and they said just get your affairs in order. Mm -hmm. And I worked with her right at that point, and she's just like, "Let's do whatever, mm -hmm. uh, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it." And I I did. I did the you know paleo, the ketogenic diet, strict, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, hyperbaric oxygen chamber therapy, IV vitamin C, uh, mitochondrial health supplements, including like exogenous ketones. Mm -hmm. uh, we did everything. There were several more things, like including like red light and blue light blocking glasses. And like I, I got her doing everything. Mm -hmm. And six weeks later, uh, it was a 90% reduction in the tumor size. 90. I got goosebumps. I forgot about 90 percent Wow. Yeah. No. Wow. And it's and interesting with, when it comes you know, to health. radiation. Yeah. Yeah, crazy. Oh, it, absolutely crazy. Um, I, and, and this may, tell me what you think about this. Like, this may be a gross simplification, but when it comes to uh, the body's ability to heal itself, I think it really kind of comes down to anti inflammatory, um, you know, healthy oxygenation, movement, nutritional um, things through healthy foods and supplementation. Um, and indeed, probably things on what do you think about alkalinity and, you know, versus um, acid and all this kind of stuff? Because I've seen some documentaries on cancer before. And, and one of the things that can be talked about is that when you've got um, high stress and high sugar, um, it can combine, it can, it can eventuate in a, a more acidic environment. And um, I've, I've heard, I'm not a doctor, um, but I've heard things about, you know, how a more acidic body um, can be an environment where cancer can thrive, whereas if it's more neutral or alkaline and, you know, anti-inflammatory and all these things we've just mentioned, that's kind of when it all starts to get back into a homeostatic um, pace. Is that is that roughly right? What's your understanding of acidity in particular? I That's like of all the things that you talked about, like I'm pretty sure of a lot of things, that's one yeah. that's like it's correlation and causation and, mm. and I don't know which is which. It's hard to delineate. Your body is really good at homeostasis. Okay. And so when you have an acidic drink or, you know, you, you have acidic foods, like the ketogenic diet is, is largely acidic in, in by nature. Um, whereas a vegan diet would be uh, more alkaline. But the, the, the keto diet that is more acidic has been shown to be anti-inflammatory. And the vegan diet has been shown to be anti-inflammatory. What I would tell you is the common thread between those when well-constructed is that they're whole food and they are healthy. And you know, keto can help with people that are tending towards metabolic syndrome and, and high insulin. Um, and then, you know, vegan, if well constructed, can have, you know, high polyphenols and, and you know, fiber and, and a lot of things that are beneficial. Mm. So to me, it's more of a, it's not so much a question. And this goes for vegan and carnivore too. You know, I think carnivore can be incredibly health, healthy and vegan can be. I mean, you can have carnivore and have spam and hot dogs and be unhealthy. You can have vegan and have Coca-Cola and gummy bears and be unhealthy. Yep. The common thread to keto, vegan, carnivore, Mediterranean, any diet is whole food and getting away from ultra processed food and having high nutrients. Yep. And that's going to be the difference. Uh, I mean, that's the common thread to me. And, and that's the one where I would focus like alkaline, acidic, it's, it's just hard for me to say. I haven't seen stuff that's really compelling. And, and if you are truly, um, you know, in like respiratory or circulatory, like acidosis or alkalosis, it's, it's life-threatening. So your body's really good at keeping things in like a, a very narrow window homeostatically. The only thing I would say is maybe if you're super heavy in one direction or the other, like there's a, a stress potentially, at least acutely on the body to try and maintain that homeostasis. Whether that has an impact, I don't know. But really in time, you do adapt to anything. So um, to me, it's not compelling enough at this point, but I'm, I'm not writing it off, but I, no. I don't see the data yet. No, thank you for that wonderful distinction. That's really, that, that, that just um, contextualizes it beautifully. Um, in terms of how, how people can get into, for example, keto, um, here's my transparency for myself. Like it gets my attention. I don't do it yet. Never say never. Um, it gets my attention. And then, then I'm probably one of the many millions of people that will look at it and go, oh, bloody hell, that looks really, you know, that looks quite full on, you know? And, and so I've not yet gone there. And, and my wife and I had talked about it. Um, and I don't know, like everyone's choice to do it is so individual. So I know that even you couldn't, you couldn't speak for other people or speak for the world. Um, but Nevertheless, do you think there's some kind of, 
is it, do people tend to gravitate towards it when it's an extreme compelling event for them, whether it be a health challenge or indeed weight loss, for example? Um, because my, my, my honesty is like, God, I get it, but I'm not sure if we want to try it yet. You know, and, but then also I, I'm humble and go, and this is the stupid bit. If I ever face a significant health challenge, I'd be like the first guy to go like, right, sign me up, Sean, you know? Um, what, what, do you, have you noticed any trends on that? Is it the extremity that tends to lead to things like keto? Yeah, for sure. And that, that's where the, the primary uh, focus will be. That's where the, the trendsetters, to your point, are, is going to be in pretty significant weight loss, especially when there's uh, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, which usually goes hand in hand with significant weight gain or, or adiposity. Um, and certainly, like you said, when you're talking about cancer, coronary heart disease, Parkinson, uh, Alzheimer's, these things are all metabolic diseases. So keto has been shown to be highly effective with these metabolic diseases because, uh -huh. yeah, exactly, because they're, they're related to insulin resistance, mitochondrial dysfunction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and all of those things lead to uh, glycation, inflammation, oxidation. Mm -hmm. So getting into a ketogenic uh, state is going to reduce the glycation, inflammation, oxidation, mitochondrial dysfunction, and insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's ideal. And it's been shown to be anti-aging too. I mean, there's, it's hard, it's, it's hard it's biomarkers that we're looking at for anti-aging or it's animal models and animal models. It's like 20 or 30% if it's pretty high levels of ketosis. Now that would probably involve one, a strict ketogenic diet and two significant fasting with that mm -hmm. and still staying active because that's glycogen depletion. So, you know, that's you know, whether that correlate, you know, no one's, I wouldn't say that, that human models are going to live 30% longer, but maybe when it comes to, when compared to the Western diet and insulin resistance, mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. um, but for you and like what you're saying, like, is there a benefit for someone that, that doesn't have significant adiposity that is not in a cancerous or Alzheimer's state or, you know, is generally healthy like you? Here's what I'd say don't think of it so much as a diet, think about it. And not only as a lifestyle, like that's mm -hmm. cool too. A lot of people talk about that, but think about it as a fuel source. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're meant to be dual fuel. We're meant to be metabolically flexible where we can tap into glucose or ketones. But right now we're in such a state where we're always eating, yep. where we have highly processed foods, uh, and we have medications that, that make us more insulin resistant and we're not exercising nearly as much. We're way more sedentary. We don't have as much fiber in our diet. We don't have as much resistant starches in our diet. We don't, uh, eat, uh, you know, in a, in a, maybe a more strict ketogenic way, like carnivore, mm -hmm. like where they've eaten that way, maybe through the winter, you know, like, so if you look back at like, and, and they would go a day, two days, three days without eating. And they called it starving back then or looking for food. Yeah. Now we call it fasting. Yeah. But essentially like we would have been dual fuel. We would have been in ketosis probably about 50% of the time. Yeah. And now we're glucosis, right? Like we're like always, always in this uh, glucose uh, state yeah. uh, using, using glucose for fuel. And then that's leading to insulin resistance a lot of the time because glucose is staying so elevated and glucose is wearing down those receptors, the GLUT4 receptors and, and causing insulin resistance and, and then leading to that inflammation, glycation, oxidation, mitochondrial dysfunction, the telomere shortening, all that stuff, the pro-aging, the pro-disease state, all the metabolic syndrome diseases, like practically every disease that you can look at that's not a genetic disease that you're born with is related to is a metabolic disease. If you can acquire it, it's a metabolic disease. So that yeah. that's what's related to uh, insulin and blood glucose being elevated. Right. So what you're telling me metabolically, and here's a metaphor, is that we are meant to be and are hybrid cars, but we've been uh, we've been chugging on the gasoline, and we need to recharge our ketogenic batteries. We need to be the Prius. Yeah, get, get, get back to the Prius. Remember those in like LA when they came out in 2000s? You know, <laughs> everyone wanted a Prius. I've got one in the garage still. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, that's a perfect analogy. I love it, Chris.
<laughs> nice. Okay, so we're going to be hybrid, and I've got two hybrid cards, so I totally get that. Um, right, interesting. Um, that's and that I think that speaks a lot to um, kind of again to give it a visual. It's like we're cleaning out the pipes in terms of that you got you got multiple fuel sources in your body and fitness, just like you know stretching and doing yoga and doing all these things where you're moving your body. Like movement it literally is creating. Um, <sighs> it's creating a dynamic environment in which your body is able to experience the different types of not just fuel source, but experience. Um, and yeah, that is kind of, that's what partly what health is about, isn't it? Being able to move variably around all these things, whether it's being like, for example, shock therapy, right? In terms of, I'm not talking about electric things here. I'm talking about going in a sauna and jumping in the icy, um, yeah, the icy lake and things like that. Your body's ability to, it's re- actually it's resilience, right? It's kind of bio resilience. You can that's have- it do that um then your body is literally healthy it's just that yeah and then and then homeostasis is it's your ability to go to that not in like an extreme stress away but more a no i i'm totally cool with going to hot to cold or keto to you know this and and then because you can swing that pendulum you homeostasis can be just you know arriving back in the middle because your body's used to jumping around a bit that's 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 so it chris like what you're talking about, like with the metabolic flexibility, like another word for flexibility is resilience. It's just like mm. that rubber band like stretch and deal with that stress, the outside stress that can affect us physiologically, mentally. It's a capacity to deal with stress in the body. It's called allostatic load. Yes. And that's the size of your stress bucket. And when, again, going back to when we had the flexibility where I said 50% of the time we were like in ketosis, mm-hmm. like just hundred years ago, I'm not even talking about thousands of years ago, just a hundred years ago, we were, we were, we had that flexibility that we no longer have. We're now easier to kill. Our, our stress bucket is very small. Mm. Our allostatic load capacity is very small. We're not very resilient. We're kind of like that example of the boy in the bubble that was like protected from all the pathogens. And you know, where does that put him? Like he's mm-hmm. now susceptible to like a single pathogen. Anything gets in and he'll die. Mm-hmm. And this is, what, this is what worries me right now about the society that we're in, yep. where we're getting ultra sterilized, where we're using antibiotics and vaccines. Right? And, I'm, and I'm not anti any of those things. I'm not anti sterilization in a clinical environment, not against ever the use of a vaccine or antibiotics. Don't misread that. It's just they're, they're becoming like, or, or masks or whatever, they're becoming the first choice instead of a later choice when you've uh, exhausted all the logical options. We should be strengthening our immune system and not like just doing things that uh, weaken it and then trying to protect that weakened immune system. Mm-hmm. We need to take the immune system to the gym, mm-hmm. right? I need to be, when I'm healthy, Mm-hmm. And I don't have diabetes and I'm not obese and I'm not elderly and all the, you know, like these, these uh, kind of prerequisite symptoms of like, uh, you know, immunocompromised, all that kind of stuff. Like mm-hmm. if I'm not in those states and I'm fairly healthy and resilient, mm-hmm. I should be around people that occasionally cough or sneeze or have dirty hands or, you know, eat food off a table that was just, you know, a little dirty or you know, my dog eats poop sometimes and drinks lake water. And my dog <laughs> yep. gets sick. That's it. Yep. Never gets sick. But, you know, people are getting sick because they're constantly on antibiotics. Every time they get a sniffle, they go to the doctor and get an antibiotic. Yes. Did you know that an antibiotic for two years will disrupt your gut? I I do. And I've had a, and that was exactly, yeah, I've heard, the, I've heard the up to two year thing. And that's from one round of one. antibiotics, right? And so it affects the flora. Um, and indeed, we are literally made up of bacteria and viruses, and it's all inside of us. It actually is part, literally part of our DNA, and it's part of epigenetics and expression and, and adaptation to the environment. And I know that you are indeed right into adaptogens, aren't you, and things like this in terms of, and this speaks to that too. I suppose that's, you know, that's where supplementation could come in. But before we even go down that road, um, these are such like, brilliant mind-blowing distinctions to me and I, and I love the depth of the knowledge um so okay so keto is it we've talked about that and we've talked about how that might be suitable for some people who have some broad benefits but indeed let's whatever we choose 
let's start being that hybrid car instead of just the, the, the single source, right? Um, what are the most effective ways, more generally, for individuals to get a sense of their bio individuality? Because I know that you talk about, I think, experimentation in your book, um, by the way, which is incredible, um, the, the energy formula, everyone <laughs> go get that. Um, and yeah, in the energy formula, you talk about experimentation and discovering your bio individuality. But like, do you have any kind of quick tips on, you know, how do I access that? Tell me, how do I find out what's the best bio individual strategy for me, you know? Well, for the time being, uh, up through the end of April, the book launches April 1st, and through the end of April, it's 99 cents. So at 400 pages, that's full color front to back with 60 plus full color diagrams, over 100 scientific citations, formulators corners that go through like all the supplements, doses, and forms, uh, resource hacks that go through the tips, the techniques, the equipment, the devices, the surveys that tell you like where you're at in your baseline and how to assess like your improvement, the chapter summaries, like it's just chock full of like stuff you can just open the book and go to. And that is the first chapter that you're talking about experiment. And by the way, it's an acronym for experiment, nutrition, exercise, routines, growth, and your tribe. So it's energy, the energy formula. And I do get into that in the, in the book and, and finding a good functional medicine doctor, an integrative medicine doctor, working on uh, your genetics, epigenetics, you know, doing the 23andMe kind of thing and, and getting that assessed and, and seeing where you're at, obviously doing blood work. Um, and then, you know, doing a, a diet, like one of my favorite things that I get into in the following chapter in nutrition is talking about doing a really strict diet. This is what I recommend in keto too, is that you start out strict, you adapt, you feel, you know what it feels like, see how it works for you. Then you have a baseline, then you can like loosen it up a little bit and do cyclical and targeted and play with net carbs and all that kind of stuff, which I talk about in there. But it's the same thing. Like I feel like with inflammation and, uh, and allergic triggers and some of these things is doing like, it's called AIP, autoimmune protocol with paleo where it's a very strict diet and then you add things in over time and you see how you do. And that's, that's why carnivore works for a lot of people. Carnivore is a very anti-inflammatory, non-allergenic trigger. As, as hyped as vegan is, almost all the allergenic triggers are in, in vegetables and fruits. So oh, right. um, yeah, <laughs> there you go. yeah. I, and not saying like vegan is necessarily bad. It just has to be well constructed and you have sure. to know what you're doing. Like all these oxalates and phytates and there's all these anti-nutrients that are in plants and paleo by and large removes those so i love the paleo diet so doing a paleo vegan diet makes sense doing a paleo keto diet makes sense doing a paleo carnivore diet makes sense where you're mm. getting you know grass-fed grass-finished you know all that kind of stuff like that makes sense uh, to me so the autoimmune protocol is like a place where i'd start uh, diet wise mm. to, uh, to assess, um, your, your bio individuality. Well, thank you very much for that. And that, that inspires me from my, my wife and my daughter, my little daughter's two and a half years old and they both have horrendous asthma. Uh, my wife has been on like a nebulizer since a kid. And even like, you know, every now and again, constantly on the bloody thing. Um, and we just don't know what it is. We, we have not figured it out yet. And we know it's a condition um, but we fully respect, we've done everything from like ripping up the old carpets to getting rid of all the crap in the house, you know, gosh, it's, it's a journey and we've not figured That's it out yet. Thing, Chris, I, I would, you know, if they're interested, by the way, if you do carnivore, it essentially is the keto, ketogenic diet too. Right, right. It's basically a zero carb diet. So you can kind of do both at the same time. Or if that's too restrictive, and it is restrictive, like I can only do it for a month or two, like every now and then, um, then I would do the, this paleo autoimmune protocol diet, and it's covered in the book. Okay. So just uh, check it out in that second chapter of nutrition. I will, I'm going to deep dive into that. You've inspired me there. Thank you very much. Um, now, okay, um, we kind of hinted at some of the, uh, you know, when we were on the plane, so to speak, and we were, we were, um, quote, starving, but then now we call it fasting. Um, what are some of the benefits at a high level about intermittent fasting in particular? Oh, man, there's there's <laughs> so many. Because we're, we're not meant to, like, eat throughout the day, Chris, because that, like, so fasting activates these sirtuin genes, these anti-aging genes. They're actually called the toughness genes or the resilience genes, the sirtuin family. Sometimes it's shortened called SIRT gene, S-I-R-T. 
And those are activated uh, through things like caloric restriction or fasting, whether it's intermittent or extended. And when you do extended, you tap into more autophagy, which is cellular detox. But either way, when you're getting away from snacking, you're allowing for the body to rest, digest, relax, recover, become more resilient. Mm -hmm. And that's important, just like you were talking about before, like with our uh, being thermically controlled, um, I forget, like you're in, yeah, I believe you're in Celsius, but uh, here. Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can do Fahrenheit too. <laughs> yeah, it would be like 68 to 72 degrees is like kind of like room temperature. And we're at that temperature all day, every day, whether we're at the office, whether in the car and, you know, at the home, we're in this tight window, right? So we no longer have to control that with our bodies. And that's why doing what you were talking about before, it's actually called contrasting. Mm. When you're going from extreme cold, like with a cold plunge, cryogenesis, whatever, and then you go into like a hot sauna, et cetera, yep. like those things are going to create that, that delta where your body has to adjust and do things to try and maintain the homeostasis itself. And it does that by activating these cert genes, just like you doing fasting. Mm -hmm. And so that's like, that's going to make you more resilient when your body's like, I don't know when we're going to get the next meal. I don't know if like we're ever going to get to like a comfortable temperature. So I need to be stronger and help us live longer and be tougher. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We've got a phrase down under. Um, it's uh, swallow a teaspoon of concrete and toughen the heck up. <laughs> he said, don't swallow the concrete. That's a bad idea for your health. Instead, just don't stick anything in your mouth. And then all of these benefits will, uh, will start to kick in. No, I, I love that. I love that. And, and actually, it's, it's interesting how our bodies kind of know this intuitively. And if you've got a healthy lifestyle, you get actually hooked on this. So for example, I lived in Australia. I live five minutes from the beach. And one of my favorite things is to get sweat on. Um, to be pumping, you know, via a run on the beach and then to jump in the ocean after. And mm. God, I am like, I guarantee my mind might be going tick, tick, tick for a little bit of the run and I get rid of all of that. It's like a meditation. And then as soon as I'm in that ocean, I'm laughing, I'm giggling because my body just goes, ah, thank you for your healthy life. You know, <laughs> it just, it sings because your body, your body recognizes what feels good. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And then also kids, right? I find it like when you think, when you see, for example, let's say a lioness um, is injured, she will go into the cave or whatever and not eat for a few days with fasting. Um, and children are the bloody same. My kids, when they're sick, they'll barely eat for 48 hours. And most parents see that and go, oh, they're not eating. Doctor, will they be okay? You know, and it's like, no, no, that's exactly what they should be doing because they know naturally that that's how their body's going to heal. And I, again, that's brilliant. So it's culture, it's culture um, and the, the culture of poor diet um, that's kind of basically, yeah, and the, sed so the sedentariness um, of office work and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, well, yeah. growth, growth, hormone, growth hormone is elevated when yep. uh, insulin and glucose are suppressed. Yep. And also autophagy is activated at the same time. And like the, uh, many of these like recovery healing uh regenerative factors mm -hmm. are elevated when uh blood glucose and insulin are suppressed so you know being in that fasting state and then there's an element of a strict ketogenic diet that is fasting mimicking so that's yes. where like ketones get elevated and obviously when you use keto plus fasting it's really good and when you do keto plus fasting plus like high intensity interval training that's glycogen depletive Yep. then that's really, really good. Mm -hmm. So those are all ways to like elevate your ketones and become more keto adapted. Now, I, I know one of the things you're also pa very passionate about is circadian rhythm, and that's a, a big topic in itself. Um, but I want to try and draw a little bit of a, a link here um, to fasting. And um, what I find interesting is that our language is often hiding some of the answers, right? And um, so even the word break fast, a break from yeah. your fast, right? Um, and um, this is a question. Um, you know, some people do intermittent fasting in the morning and then eat at lunchtime. There's, there's lots of different places in the day you can do it. There might not be one answer, but from your perspective and the links to circadian rhythm, um, you know, I, I've read in a few places um, and I, I want to hear your point of view about um, eating after it's gone dark and things like that and, and all that kind of stuff. Are there any links to, you know, when are actually, I, I've, I've indeed been exposed to the idea of, you know, eat literally whilst it's natural and uh, daylight. 
Um, and don't, it's also quite, I think, common in health now that, you know, if you're into your health, you kind of know that you shouldn't be eating at 9 p.m., 10 p.m. at night, you know, because it's, you know, it's not, you're not having time to even digest your food. But what's actually the optimal when it comes to circadian rhythms, intermittent fasting, and is there a link? And, you know, what should, how should you bring these things together? Totally. There totally is. And circadian rhythm is also known as a sleep wake cycle. Yep. Or think of it as a day night cycle. Your body links up. I mean, just like, uh, a woman's menstrual cycle can link up to the, the lunar cycle and, and our waves in the ocean are controlled by the moon. And, and so think about like how much like we're controlled by the sun and the, you know, the moon, the, the day and the night. And it's really fascinating, uh, like how much our bodies sync up with that stuff. And, and it really does like we're like melatonin gets blocked when the sun is out and melatonin starts get, getting released when it's dark, unless we're impairing it with blue light exposure, which happens, unless we're impairing it with eating during the evening, which happens. And so a lot of times we're watching TV and we're eating. And so Dr. Wow. Yeah, Dr. So, 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 so there's a link. And there's, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. That's like that, that, that just blew my mind. So literally eating in the evening um, when it's dark, is that is that interrupting melatonin production? Yes. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so Dr. Sachin Panda's data has looked at this with, uh, with circadian rhythm that you want to be eating during that daylight window, uh, uh, period for your, your, um, eating, eating window, or sometimes it's called feeding window with animals. But like, if you're doing inter intermittent fasting, that's what you'd want to look at. I do like, uh, in, um, a 16 and eight, right. A 16, uh, fasting and then eight hour eating window. And my eight hour eating window is 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. so that I'm eating uh, when it's still light out. And when it's dark, I'm no longer eating. And we're not nocturnal creatures. And by the way, if you look at like shift displacement syndrome, like bas basically like working night shift, right? These people live 30% shorter lives, 30% less long. That's dramatic. That's a dramatic number. Like if you're supposed to live to, you know, 80, we're talking about you, you know, maybe not making it to 60. So that's a huge difference. And by the way, when you get six and a half hours or less sleep, you're acutely insulin resistant. This explains the brain fog. This explains why your neurons are tired. They literally fire slower and they're energy starved. And that's why you want caffeine and sugar in the morning when you're tired because they need something to get going. They need something to get firing. And so when you get proper sleep, you're not in that insulin resistance state. And they've shown that when you're, when you're getting six and a half hours or less, that you're three times more likely to get coronary heart disease. You're five times more likely to get type two diabetes. So you need to get consistent sleep. And this is such a key. And obviously a big part of that is, you know, blocking that blue light in the evening, not eating too late, and then getting enough blue light in the morning by getting sunshine, getting outside, et cetera, not staying in your home and staying in dark rooms and whatever. And then, you know, eating, eating during that appropriate, you know, daylight window. So uh, those are going to be massive to have proper circadian rhythm I also get into like proper sleep hygiene and creating a sleep fortress in the book. The sleep hygiene is trying to get to bed at the same time every night and set that consistently because when you are, uh, especially like people that do, it's called social jet lag, when on the weekends you're traveling essentially two, three, four extra hours and then trying to come back to your time zone, right? Because you stayed up two or three or four hours later. And so that, that has a huge impact on your circadian rhythm. Yep. Now, is it okay to do this occasionally? Yes, that's a hormetic stress and it's positive for your allostatic load. Is it, is it good to do this consistently? No, you'll be insulin resistant and you'll be more likely to get coronary heart disease, diabetes and have a shorter life. So, you know, literally getting enough sleep like the seven to nine hour window is critical. And one of my biggest hacks that I talk about in the book that's a super cheap one, but powerful is taping your mouth. And a lot of people think 
tape on your mouth? Like, yes, they make a paper, like a paper tape by 3M. You can also buy some strips that are like Somnifix and whatever that are like for this purpose, but you can just get super cheap paper tape that's light enough, but it'll stick. Yeah. I like to eat it because I have some facial hair and uh, I need like longer strips, but it keeps your mouth shut so that you're a nasal breather and you have better quality sleep, which is extremely important as well. When you're breathing through your nose, you have much better oxygenation, like radically different. And yes. like this is incredibly true if you're apneic, like if you snore, yep. this is massively true. But even if you don't snore, taping your mouth, you'll feel more rested and recovered. And take it another step, if you get good at, at doing this, you can like, you can do this like during your workouts or hikes. I know it would look weird if you're at the gym, but like if you're working out at home or, you, or you're on a hike taping your mouth, you'll learn to be a nasal breather and you will feel more recovered, more energetic, more oxygenated. So that's a massive game changer, very cheap to do. Mm -hmm. that, okay, brilliant. I mean, I wanna make a comment on that, but also thank you for drawing a connection to insulin resistance, melatonin production and the time you eat and intermittent fasting. That's just a whole line of connection I didn't realize existed. So. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And um, and then the nasal breathing thing, 100%. When my wife and I um, had our first baby, we went to the, the classes and they talked about that and how breathing through the nose um, gets into a, um, a parasympathetic response. Am I getting that right? Yes. And then and that helps literally ripen uh, the womb, which relaxes the muscles and the blood flow to actually give birth in a more, um, yeah, vibrant way and that, and that I and I knew I found that fascinating but I also knew that from my years of yoga um so I go ah yeah I get it and that's why in yoga it's all about that you know not through the mouth yeah um, yeah and in particular add to that if you're talking about parasympathetic states mm -hmm. uh, not only breathing through the nose you can breathe out through the mouth if you want but breathing in through the through the nose and then doing belly breathing yes so the more diaphragmatic breathing that's lower lobes of the lungs. When you're in the upper lobes, it tends to be like a more sympathetic nervous system, more fight or yes. flight. Yes. So the better you get at kind of sticking your belly out when you're breathing, getting into more diaphragmatic, the diaphragms at the bottom of your ribs, right? That diaphragmatic breathing, then you're going to get into more of that uh, rest and digest parasympathetic state. Exactly. Um, now let's, 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 I would love to make a link to supplementation here. So, um, Again, I, you know, I've, I've looked at the book of what she talks, um, looked at your website. I know that you're, you know, you're, you're into this stuff, right? You're into supplementation and, 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 and creating um, the right ingredients to, to support one's life. And I, I want to talk about nootropics. I want to talk about ashwagandha. But before we do, what about melatonin in particular? Because, of course, it's preferential um, to balance out your life in a way, whether it be the time that you eat, not having too much caffeine, you know, not you know, not being insulin, um, having problems with your insulin. Um, like, is there a place nevertheless um, for using supplements um, in the melatonin area? Um, and does that link to any particular conditions such as, you know, again, I've read some interesting articles around fibromyalgia in particular, because when you've got fibromyalgia, it can be um, problems with sleeping, I understand. And so I guess my question is, is there a place for supplementation in the form of melatonin um, to kind of aid this circadian um, rhythm piece? Yeah, melatonin is really interesting and is a hormone. Yes. So, I mean, that's something to be cognizant of that you are you are engaging in hormone replacement therapy. Right. Now, this means potentially as you age, melatonin naturally declines. Yep. Now, there's a lot of things that you could be doing that you should try first, kind of like we talked about with don't go straight to antibiotics and vaccines, like do all the stuff to boost your immune system first, right? Well, this is true, like with melatonin, do the stuff that boosts melatonin production naturally first. Mm -hmm. Things like wearing the blue light blocking glasses in the evening, yep. getting the sunshine in the morning, not eating late at night, not doing things that are highly stressful at night, mm -hmm. doing things like relaxing, doing the belly breathing, doing the deep breathing at night, doing meditation in the evening. All of those things are going to help get you into that state where melatonin uh, release is going to be more optimized. Mm -hmm. But from there, like if you're still not getting the quality of sleep you want, then I would take some melatonin, especially if you're getting on in years, like, you know, 40, 50, 60, you know, like it's really declines. Mm -hmm. So, you know, taking a small, like I like to, again, the same idea, start small and go up as needed. I wouldn't start high and then just stay there. 
So you want to still maintain some natural production of melatonin. And so like taking too high a dose might, might preclude that. And then you might have issues when you try and get off it or you don't have enough or you run out of it or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, taking, you can get it as low as 300 micrograms, which is 0.3 milligrams. And it goes all the way up to about 10 milligrams. So mm -hmm. that's a 30 fold difference. And there's plenty of room to experiment and kind of start with the lowest dose and then work your way up titrating. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we at Peak Dawn, we, we do supplements as well, and we've got a sleep well gummy, you know, and, and um, <laughs> they are, they are they're bloody delicious. But also like I, the attitude I take to it is that sometimes I'm completely guilty of having maybe that second or third cup of coffee in the day in the afternoon, and then it just screws me for the night. Mm -hmm. um, so like if, I, if I've done that because I felt it was necessary, whatever the circumstance was, on certain select days, speaking to your point of not being, you know, wanting to do all the other healthy things as a priority first, that's when I would go to that because I know the importance of sleep for me um, and for anyone. Um, so yeah, I, I very much agree. It's got to be um, holistically linked to a philosophy of what else you're doing in your life to just have naturally uh, good sleep. But people, including myself, sometimes just need it. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so now fibromyalgia is also fascinating to me. It's not something I suffer from, but I, I, I have people in my life that I know, how, you know, go through that um and indeed it's been something that's been part of it for you um what about ashwagandha and that like can you give me a point of view on ashwagandha and all this stuff because i know it's something that you're an advocate of again like i use it every day i, I notice it for mood stress response um in terms yep. of you know is that a technically an adaptogen when it's um in the in the stress response yeah cool i'm learning <laughs> um and um yeah and then also mood yeah into mood energy production and stress response like I, it's, it's palpable to me um and i'll take that say five times a week um and it just i feel bloody great um and i know it's ayurvedic and, and all that stuff and tell me your point of view on ashwagandha and like links to fibromyalgia and all this stuff what what kind of stuff is ashwagandha good for yeah, so what you're talking about in that class of adaptogens, if you look across the world, like the most storied herbs in all the different cultures, if you go to Russia, it's rhodiola. If you go down to South America, it's maca. If you go to Asia, it's ginseng. If you go to India, it's ashwagandha. Hmm. You know, these, these compounds are legendary because they're adaptogens because they help your body adapt. They do almost everything because what it's doing is normalizing your stress response and, cap and capacity, right? It's increasing the size of that allostatic load bucket, that stress bucket. So these things are helping you be more resilient mm. as polyphenols, which is another thing that I discuss heavily in the book, things like EGCG from green tea, um, chlorogenic acid from coffee, trans resveratrol from uh, red wine, mm -hmm. uh, terastilvine from blueberries, quercetin from uh, onions and apples, et cetera, et cetera. But the adaptogens are certainly a favorite of mine and probably my two favorite are rhodiola and ashwagandha. Mm. They're going to both improve focus and energy and well-being and also improve your sleep and yep. recovery. Yep. Because they're helping optimize you and your stress capacity. We tend to think, oh, if it's going to help one thing, it's going to, it's not going to help the other because we're used to like uppers and downers. We're oh, used to thank like- Thank you for saying that. It's you know, a really good point. Yeah, exactly. People go, oh, is that an upper? Is that an upper? Or do I need to do, can I do that at the same time? Yeah, right. But it's an adaptogen. Sorry, that, that, again, another it's, link. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, um, yeah, the, the range. You can do the range. Yeah. Yep. Something that optimizes you is going to help both. Right. And that's a good- know that if that's what you should consistently be using and save those uppers or downers for more extreme you know situations and i'm not just talking about drugs i'm talking about even supplements totally. like trying things that improve your your capacity for stress improve your resilience when you look at like something like methylcobalamin the active form of b12 it helps with focus and brain function it helps with sleep mm -hmm. when you look at uh, choline like an optimized source like alpha gpc it helps with focus. It helps with sleep mm. because you're optimizing the body. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and yeah, and then I suppose that's also another link to things like nootropics, right? So from a nootropic point of view, often nootropics will have um, you know, a, lot of B, a lot of B vitamins in there. Um, and that's all about energy production, um, right? And so again, it's, it's <laughs> getting your hybrid car firing on all cylinders. 
literally. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Do you do caffeine? I'm interested. I don't. I just do decaf uh, coffee and I have like MCTs and collagen uh, yep. in there. And uh, I do use my ingredients that I patented on occasion, like tea cream and dynamine, yep. uh, because they don't have the habituation and, uh, and adaptation effects that, that caffeine have. And they have like a lot less side effects, lower toxicity, et cetera. I want to hear about this, right? So yeah, your novel ingredients, Can, tell me one of them again. I want to get the name right. Uh, tea cream is the branded name and it's theocrine. It's in the methyl xanthine family, similar to caffeine theobromine, theophylline. Right. And then the other one is dynamine, which is uh, the actual uh, compound is called methylibrine. And what does dynamine do? Tell me the benefits of dynamine, because I'm intrigued by this, because you've gone down yeah, to the source. Yeah, it's in the methylxanthine family. So it's going to be a central nervous stimulant similar to uh, caffeine. Mm -hmm. It has a half-life very similar to caffeine. So it hits quick, acts quick. T-Cream is a much longer lasting. So it's kind of good for like that all day feeling. Whereas dynamine might be good more for acute, acute use, like a pre-workout or something like that. And of course you can blend the two and they stack really well. But dynamine uh, and, and T-Cream are going to not have the habituation effect like where, like it's been shown in studies with animals that by the third day of caffeine administration, they needed that dose just to get to baseline. So when you see people in, in line at Starbucks, especially when I'm at a convention or a show or something, and the line is like 500 people deep and you're like, why are these people waiting an hour plus dollars <laughs> for a coffee? It's because they literally cannot get going without it. Yep. And so it's, uh, it's habituation. And then the adaptation effect is that it is less efficacious over time, yes. that you need more and more and more to get the effect. And these other um, uh, methyl xanthines like t cream and dynamine uh, are not like that. They don't have the habituation or adaptation effects that caffeine has. Salt the man down under. That is, that's really interesting because that is my guilty habit. That's my, you know, I'm pretty good, <laughs> but my guilty habit is two massive cups of coffee a day. And I, and I know it, you, what you just described. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. I know there's, there's also an epigenetic component with caffeine that's not present with the others, uh, okay. the other methods that there's people that are fast and slow metabolizers. And you and if you get your genetic data, you can find this out fast and slow metabolizers of caffeine. And some people that are slow metabolizers of caffeine uh, really feel like the brain fog, feel the side effects, the arrhythmias, like it actually impairs their health. And for me, that's where I'm at. And then there's people on the opposite end where they like, I can drink coffee and go straight to bed and they're not getting much benefit from the caffeine. So those are the fast metabolizers. And then there's the people in between that kind of get, you know, that get the benefit and don't have much side effects. Well, exactly. And then, and then that comes back down to bioindividuality, doesn't it? And I know that mitochondrial health, um, you mentioned in your book um, about this particular blood markers, I, I, HSCRP, HBV, you know, and, and OX, LDL, like th these are things that's totally your territory. And this is getting quite scientific. But the point for me is that you can, via blood markers, measure mitochondrial function. And um, I mean, indeed, at your, uh, your talk, to kind of bring it back down to where we started, um, in 2019 at KetoCon, you talked about how the future of health is going to be about mitochondrial function. Just for those that don't really know maybe even what mitochondrial function is and just kind of like to, as much as you can, boil it down to basics, like what, what is it and, and why is that going to be the key thing for the future? Because I'm, I'm with you and I, I get this stuff, but for the benefit of the audience, like what's it all about? Yeah, so the mitochondria are an organelle in the cell, like organelle just means like kind of thinking of the cell as a, as a human body and, and the organelle is similar to our organ. So it's one of the things that's doing stuff in the cell. And its function is to make that cellular energy. It's the little power plant, the little factory, if you will, that's creating ATP, the energy currency for the body. And that means adenosine triphosphate. And you might remember that from biology and the, and the Krebs cycle. It's also called the citric acid cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle. It's that little crank that's producing ATP in the mitochondria. And there's even like the electron transport chain that's associated with that and all that kind of stuff, if you remember mm -hmm. that. But that, that cellular energy is so critical. And we're often in what's called insufficient cellular energy states. It's called ICE as the acronym 
or in the brain, it's called brain energy gap. It's the same idea. And we're not making enough energy and there's a shortfall. And what happens is over time, you know, kind of to your point of like, uh, you know, that, that car being more of a, uh, maybe a, an electric car and we're trying to put in gas, it's functioning like suboptimally. Maybe, maybe the better example is like you putting, uh, you know, a diesel or regular into your super, uh, you know, sports car that, that's supposed to get the super gas, you know? And so like over time, that shortfall is creating more glycation, inflammation, oxidation, and it's also shortening the telomere length that's associated with aging and disease. And it's, you know, lowering these, the sirtuin gene activation and all these things that we know are pro-aging and pro-disease. And so we need enough mitochondrial energy to run our body well. And like, literally, like we have the fibromyalgia as a result, the chronic fatigue syndrome as a result, the hypertonic muscles as a result, because the body just can't keep up. So it's going to start breaking down and functioning suboptimally. And when we do things like that and boost our resilience, it not only enhances the mitochondria's function, but these sirtuin genes and, and doing things like fasting or cold or hot exposure or doing exercise, they're going to increase mitochondrial biogenesis. That means more mitochondria. So that means more energy. So that's, that's the ideal is that you have more mitochondria and you'll have less of that insufficient cellular energy state. Love it. And I feel like your journey personally and professionally has now come to this place of a full circle thing, right? Where you've gone through these health challenges, you've become a deep expertise across multiple realms. And indeed, the energy formula, your book delivers that outcome. And it's, and it's so not just, it's very much for people with more extreme health conditions. But this is, there's a universality um, to indeed the cellular level um, of energy production and um, and, and I absolutely think that that is what life's all about. And, and what, you, what you are, Sean, to me, is someone that um, has got integration knowledge, right? And that's why I couldn't recommend this book enough to people because you're not just saying, just do this or just take a supplement or just look at that diet. It's no, there are multiple realms of life. They all have got these dots that link to each other and can support or fight with each other and all that. And it's about creating this integrated, um, yeah, approach to, literally energy production so i think that you are a a rare and valued human being in this world and i just want to acknowledge you for the incredible work that you're doing oh thank you so much chris i appreciate that yeah and i appreciate the support of the book and being on your show and and i'd love like literally i'm not making i've spent probably 100 150 thousand on making this book this is just pure passion for yeah. me and I am not making money on this 99 cents. It's literally so it can be in people's hands. Not only like if you go to energyformula.com, do you get the book, but you also get a fasting for energy guide free. That's 25 pages cited on how to properly do fast, what your fasting type is, how it's different for women, all that kind of stuff. There's a hidden chapter on natural movement, ancestral movement, like crawling and what's called exercise snacks, like how to move throughout the day and and disrupt sitting syndrome, like that we're too sedentary and all the health uh, implications there. It's like the new smoking, as they're saying, we need to be cognizant of that. And then there's live Q and A's and like, you'll get free, uh, free recipe book, all this stuff comes free. And then if you buy the hardcover, which I'm partial to, but that's $39.99, but know that it cost me $39.80 to make it. And it's full color front to back yeah. in like full color diagrams. And it's just, stacked like i said with all the information all the stuff and uh i literally just want it in people's hands and impact lives that's that's what i'm trying to do i love it i love it well look, we'll make sure that we put the uh the links to the energy formula website and um, there's also sean wells your website as well um and indeed we'll put links to the keto con 2019 for those that are interested in your backstory of course to that um, but then otherwise, um, how can people follow you? I believe that, you know, well, I, I know it, um, you have got quite a great following on Instagram and other social medias. Are they, wh where are the best places to hit you up from a social media point of view? Yeah. So for the book, energyformula.com for my personal site with all the newsletters and, and cited scientific guides I have on like immune health and, uh, supplementation and all this stuff there, uh, seanwells.com, S-H-A-W-N. And then I'm on Instagram at Sean Wells, again, S-H-A-W-N. 
And then uh, Clubhouse, I've been doing a ton lately and I'm at biohacking on Clubhouse. I'm doing a show practically every day with someone. Uh, so I'm talking about all that fun stuff there as well. So yeah, I'd appreciate it. If, uh, people follow me and, and they can DM me with any questions from your show. I get back to everyone personally. So yeah. Thanks for having me on, Chris. Absolute pleasure. Sean Wells, you are a legend. Um, all the best with the, the launch of the book. And I know that it's going to change lives. So we'll put all that in the show notes below. And this is Pete Dawn with Chris Hall. And if you are enjoying what you're listening to, please hit that subscribe button on YouTube or iTunes or Spotify, wherever you are in the world. Sean Wells, you're a legend. We'll speak again. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it.